Hello and welcome. Thank you all for joining us for another iteration of Authors at Google, where we are very pleased to welcome Sydney Padua. I hope I actually pronounced that right. I failed to ask. OK. Um, so in recent months, we've had the good fortune here to host many leading lights. Uh, you know, we had uh, uh, Barney Frank and more recently David Duchovny. But today's guest puts all of those to shame. Uh, we are uh, happy to have a pre preeminent scholar of the Victorian computing era uh, among us, uh, Sydney Padua, who uh, hails from Canada, uh, did her uh, gr her schoolwork at uh, University of Alberta, where she got a PhD apparently in footnotes, um, <laughs> and has uh, since become both an impressive comic artist and uh, impressive scholar of the history of early computing. Um, and as I was just saying to her, I'm very glad that she reads all the primary source materials so that I don't have to, uh, because there's quite a copious amount of it. And I am truly impressed by the depth to which she has uh, she's explored it. Uh, so I guess without further ado, we'll welcome Sydney to tell us all about Lovelace and Babbage and the marvelous history of computing. Uh, thanks. Uh, hi. Um, yeah, my name is Sydney Padua. Uh, I don't have a PhD, I should hasten to say. Um, I'm actually, uh, so this is me. Uh, I am just a random cartoonist uh, and also a VFX artist. Um, most of the time, I um, uh, can be found uh, making imaginary monsters appear to attack people for the movies. Um, I. Um, came from hand-drawn animation many years ago. I worked on Iron Giant, which um, is a film a lot of people really like. Uh, um, since then, I've moved on to uh, computers, where um, apparently I work on blue and orange movies. <laughs> um, and I have to say, it's, it's really um, uh, very strange and hilarious. And five years ago, if you told me I would be giving a talk on computers at Google, uh, I would have laughed in your face because I was a very, very reluctant convert uh, to computer animation. Um, I've always uh, distrusted, distrusted computers. Um, I was uh, probably the last person to be dragged backwards uh, with my fingernails digging into the carpet uh, into CG from hand-drawn animation. Um, but uh, the reason I'm here is uh, because of these two crazy kids. Um, so that's uh, Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage. Um, I think a lot of people know their story roughly from Computer Science 101. You kind of get the quick rundown. Um, Charles Babbage, the Cajun professor of mathematics at Cambridge, um, the position once held by Newton and currently held, I believe, by Stephen Hawking. Um, so he's pretty clever. Um, he uh, was famous in his own time for uh, this mysterious calculating machine, which was perpetually planned and never built, um, which we would now recognize as a computer. And it, it is really amazing, their computer, um, as I'll talk about a bit later. Um, the other person in that uh, duo is um, Ada Lovelace. Um, she was born Ada Gordon, uh, probably better known as Ada. Uh, Ada Gordon, daughter of George Gordon, better known as Lord Byron, uh, the infamous poet. Um, I, I learned about these people um, when I was in a pub uh, in London with a friend of mine, Sue Sharman Anderson, um, who started this thing called Ada Lovelace Day, which you might be familiar with. Um, it's a sort of an online blogging festival every year to celebrate women in computing and raise their profile. Um, and she said to me, Sydney, you're a woman in tech now. You should do a blog post for Ada Lovelace Day. Um, and I said, I don't even know who Ada Lovelace is. Uh, I'm also not really a woman in tech. I work on tech. I'm not in tech. Um, but I went to Wikipedia like anybody else would. And uh, there I found this extraordinary story um, about Lovelace, who uh, was raised by mathematicians so that she would not become a crazy poet uh, like her father. And, it had this very much a feel of a superhero origin story. You know, it had, had that nice angsty backstory um, conflict. Uh, and I thought, oh, that would make a really cute little comic. And I thought, because I didn't know who Lovelace was, that I should probably 
a nice idea for a blog post would just be a short little comic. I did it as a strip, so it's like, <laughs> it's about this long. Um, just explaining the way the Lovelace is. And I did it like this. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is all true. Um, I can now verify having read a hell of a lot of letters, um, sorry, heck of a lot of letters, um, that uh, Lovelace's mother was very concerned that she, become, that she not become poetical, um, which I believe was a Victorian euphemism for uh, not ladylike or wild. Um, so she had her tutored in mathematics uh, and logic. Um, she met Babbage at a party in 1833. It's always the best place to meet someone. Um, he's leaning there on the only um, working fragment of a machine that he built. Um, that's a fragment of the difference engine, which was a calculator. Um, you can actually see that, uh, that uh, piece, a uh, beautiful machine um, made of brass in the <coughs> Science Museum in London. It's about this big. And you could turn a crank and it could turn out uh, you know, some little calculations. Um, at this party, apparently someone said, uh, has everyone gazed upon the machine like savages looking at a looking glass? Um, only Ada Byron understood the true beauty of the machine and understood its function. Um, she sort of hung out with Babbage um, for uh, a while. She became very fascinated with his machine, in fact, obsessed with the analytical engine. Um, and uh, wrote, of course, a famous paper uh, about it, which I'll talk about it in a bit. Um, however, this was a very short comic. I should stress uh, the original comic uh, was maybe four um, pages long laid out. And of course, I reached the end, uh, which um, is a really stupid ending, um, that Babbage doesn't build his machine, and uh, Lovelace dies at 36. Um, and it's 100 years before there's another computer. So this was a real dead end, uh, unfortunately, in computing history. Um, and I think I knocked this whole comic out in an evening. Um, and when I reached this panel, it was about midnight. And I thought, oh, I can't end it like that. Um, you know, that's terrible. So I just threw in, as a joke, uh, this panel. Um, I think I was aware of steampunk as a thing that existed. Um, so I just kind of threw them in fabulous clothes and gave them ray guns uh, and sort of resurrected them briefly as a punchline. Um, I think I was thinking of the Avengers. <laughs> it's uncanny. <laughs> the, so I kind of put the, threw the comic up online on my blog and went to bed. And then when I woke up this, the next morning, it was turning up all over the internet as um, this person is going to do a comic in which Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage fight crime. <laughs> it was a joke. Um, I uh, succumb easily to peer pressure, and uh, <laughs> also I was putting off working on something else. Um, so I started drawing comics about Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage fighting crime. Um, anyone who's read the comic will tell you this is a very sporadic uh, comic. Um, uh, they fight crime. They fight it quite badly. Um, it's quite a silly comic, I should stress. Anyone expecting a very serious comic uh, about Victorian computing is going to be out of luck because it's quite silly. Um, especially because their chief enemies, of course, as they were in life, are uh, poetry and street music, uh, which was <laughs> Babbage's famous bugbear was, uh, was street music. So that's kind of his main nemesis, is the organist. Aside from um, uh, silly comics, um, if you look at the book, you will notice there's quite a lot of words in it for a comic. Um, this is because as I was doing the blog, um, I, um, I became very obsessed with reading kind of all the wonderful primary documents that were turning up online. Um, in a sense, uh, the, the footnotes are a joke on um, Lovelace's famous paper, which you can see on Google Books. Um, this is it as it originally appeared. Um, Lovelace wrote her paper, uh, it began as a translation. Um, Babbage himself never wrote, never published um, anything as an, on his own uh, machine or anything in detail. And of course, women did not normally publish scientific papers. This was not something that was done. Um, however, there was a space for women to do translations um, as, as a sort of a ladylike accomplishment. Um, so when this paper, this is Menebrea, um, a guy, 
He eventually became Prime Minister of Italy. At the time, he was a guy um, at a uh, conference where Babbage spoke and described his machine. Minabre took notes. He published the notes in French. Um, a year later, Lovelace translated the notes from the French into the English um, and began adding footnotes. Because as she wrote along, um, she herself was considered an expert on Babbage's machine at this time, um, mostly by um, hanging out and continually begging him for their plans. Um, uh, so she was known as someone who knew a lot about it. That's why she was asked to translate the paper. Um, but um, as she kind of went down the translation, she began to add footnotes saying, oh, actually, I have a much clearer illustration of this. Or in fact, um, you know, another way to say this is this um, are a lot. I think to some extent, she's actually writing the footnotes to Babbage because she often says things like, I don't know if this has occurred to the creator of the calculating machine, but I have this idea about uh, how this could actually work. Um, and this is one of those notes where she says, um, this is the first appearance of general computing theory um, in enabling the mechanism to combine together general symbols in successions of unlimited variety and extent. The united link is, and she goes on, she's Victorian, so um, these sentences <laughs> get extremely lengthy. Um, if you battle your way through this paper, you'll see it's not the most uh, readable thing in the world. But it is wonderful, and it can be found on uh, Google Books. Uh, which is my favorite thing in the world and which is why I'm so delighted always to speak to Google because um, this entire comic would not have been possible um, without the incredible cornucopia of amazing documents that were poured out uh, right around 2009 when I began the comic. Um, uh, Google Books was dumping basically all this uh, 19th century ephemera uh, online and so um, I should stress again, I'm not a proper scholar. I am just some random clown. But the great power of Google Books is that um, uh, I'm not, I don't have to go to some specific place in an archive and know what I'm looking for. I can just type, yeah, Babbage Street Music, 1830 to 1870. And you would get amazing amounts of stuff. Um, this is what it looks like in situ. Great, cal I great calculator, anecdotes of the famous problem solver Babbage. Um, I think the first thing I was surprised to find when I started um, my research uh, was how famous Babbage was. Um, this is actually from the Salt Lake City News. Um, and Babbage was famous enough that, that the Salt Lake City News would run like a, a kind of some random anecdotes about him. I also like this because of the pocket cigar case, free to smoke as if towns is fun. Um, uh, this is a great set of anecdotes. This is in the book, um, I believe, and this actually um, there comes some lovely stuff in the end. I think she says, um, our family is an alternate stratification of poetry and mathematics uh, along the line there. Um, also, to get a sense of the Victorian era, a clever woman is one whose ability is never unpleasantly felt by the rest of the world. Um, so yeah, I, I found just fantastic stuff. Uh, oh, his calculating machine was an endless subject of monologue. Uh, a lot of people remark on Babbage's <laughs> tendency to go on and on about his calculating machine. Um, what else? Uh, of course, it wasn't only Google that I found stuff in. This is um, I, I, the general method of my approaching the comic was I would uh, run around, read a bunch of primary documents, and uh, and then just riff on it basically on a comic. Um, this is from when uh, Queen Victoria's diaries were digitized. Uh, and put online. So of course, I immediately searched Babbage, um, who was, by the way, very obsessed with what other people thought about him. He used to keep a scrapbook with all of his news clippings in it. Uh, and I like this. This is a classic Babbage quotation. Lord M, that's Lord Melbourne, has said, Babbage has made a great fool of himself, as he does everywhere. Uh, poor old Babbage. Um, he, was, uh, he had many, many fantastic talents, but um, uh, he did have some issues socializing <laughs> properly with people. Um, so that's Queen Victoria on Charles Babbage. Um, this is Babbage in Punch. Uh, on the Great Exhibition, he's very angry at uh, only being honorably mentioned. Is that all scandalous uh, to go into the Great Exhibition of 1851? Um, he was very angry that they didn't put his calculating machine uh, in there. I think the feeling was that, it, uh, that people would not understand what it was, um, which I think shows a sad uh, 
underestimation of the British public. I think people would have thought it was great. Um, I like this one, Babbage the Logarithmetical Frankenstein. <laughs> uh, that's from Google Books. Um, a ton, there's a ton of primary documents uh, in, uh, in the book, um, probably too many, apparently. Um, uh, this is 1833, The New York Mirror. Oh, fi, you need good eyes to read this one. Uh, oh, fi, it is said that Ada Byron, sole daughter of a noble bard, is the most coarse and vulgar woman in England. Uh, which I do have her swear <laughs> a fair bit, so that's sourced. Uh, if, anyone's <laughs> if anyone's dubious about the historical accuracy of... Uh, uh, you'll notice these, these wrong pop-ups here. That is also sourced. Babbage did, in fact, invent an error pop-up for the analytical engine, um, believe it or not. If any mistake had been made by the attendant and the wrong logarithm had been accidentally given to the engine, at the proper place, it would see a plate above the logarithm with the word wrong engraved on it. He later adds the continually ringing loud bell, which I'm sure would be absolutely delightful if you were the attendant trying to hunt down this error <laughs> in this gigantic machine. Um, so this is Lovelace debugging uh, one of these error pop-ups here uh, with your crowbar, which is the only way you can debug the analytical engine. Um, no, so, uh, so, so this is just my joke on the subject. Uh, let's see how Lady Lovelace is getting on some cartoon swears, which I won't say, because this is being recorded. Uh, that's a special language we're developing just for the engine. Um, so amongst, I mean, the, Babbage and Lovelace were actually both very funny people. People tended to remark on them as being eccentric and tell stories about how strange they were. Um, but amongst all the wonderful things in Google Books, this is by far my favorite. Um, this was a really magical find uh, that would only have been possible uh, with Google Books because um, this is from a thing called the Southern Review, which was a short-lived journal out of, I believe, Maryland. Um, it's a, it's, it was uh, put out in 1867, this is from, uh, to celebrate the culture of the South in the wake of the Civil War. Um, and it, what it reads like is a church circular. It's clippings from all sorts of random stuff happening around Maryland, generally speaking. Uh, but one of them is, is a, Basic, your basic letter home to the folks from the guy who took a trip to Europe. Um, uh, this is Walter Reed, um, who's a wonderful writer, by the way. He was actually from Pennsylvania, an um, English professor there. And he writes by far the most vivid description of Babbage um, that I found from the period. This is actually a letter from 1854. Um, I don't know why. They, I guess they had some space to fill in the old Southern Review uh, 10 years later, because. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure why they put it in. They put in the entire letter, which is about 13 pages long. Um, and he meets uh, several people, but one of them is Babbage. Um, and there's just a magical section. This is about two years after Lovelace had died. Um, and we get here, after he got up to go, by some chance of conversation, the late Lady Lovelace's name, Lord Byron's daughter Ada, was mentioned. He knew her intimately and spoke highly of her mathematical powers and of her peculiar capability, higher, he said, than a, that of anyone he knew to prepare, I believe it was the descriptions connected with his calculating machine. I fear I'm not expressing myself rightly here as to the precise nature of the subject. Um, and I think he's talking about the programs here, um, the descriptions of how the machine would go through a problem. Um, so this is, um, uh, this is something that would not have been found without Google search, basically. If you're a Babbage scholar, um, I can't see any conceivable reason you would be reading through every single issue of the Southern Review, 1867. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you, Google. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's just a magical thing. Um, so um, the other kind of stream of research I took um, was regarding the analytical engine. Um, in addition to all these, I, they, all these wonderful primary documents, they were extremely evocative of Babbage and Lovelace's people. They're extremely vivid personalities, um, and they write all their own material. They have, uh, <laughs> they come up with great gags for themselves and great dialogue. Um, but there's sort of a third character um, in the comic, and that was always the analytical engine. Um, as I said, I'm not a computer person. Um, I. Uh, um, so for me, when I tended to draw the engine, it's this vast, building-sized labyrinth of confusion. Um, people tend to get lost and attacked in it. 
But uh, I guess as I, as I was drawing the comic, I began um, being really frustrated by the fact that um, pretty much every book, even fairly specialist books on the engine, uh, would A, say it was exactly like a modern computer, but it's too complicated for you to understand it. Um, and also, they wouldn't give me a drawing of the engine, which um, really, as a comic artist, I want to see a drawing of a huge ass huge ass engine made of made of cogs um, you know it's just eye candy so um, uh, I had to um, actually make one myself so you can get a sense of what this engine was um, a lot of you are familiar sorry this is my own video and I know I shot it like a noob in portrait um, so this is the beautiful uh, let me turn on the sound because you have to hear it this is the uh, difference engine um, that they built in Mountain View, California. This is them demonstrating it for me, which is just wonderful of them. You can hear me oohing and eyeing <laughs> like an idiot uh, over it. Uh, those beautiful arms at the back are carrying the ones. Um, so that's the difference engine. It's a huge machine and it's incredibly beautiful and incredibly clever, um, but that's not the analytical engine. Um, there's two machines of Babbage, uh, the difference engine and the analytical engine. Um, the uh, difference engine is essentially an adder. Uh, it, it really only adds. It adds in a very specific way, um, in a very clever way, but it can only add. Um, right around eight, the 1830s, early 1830s, um, pretty much when Babbage met Lovelace, um, he, uh, he began to think, what if you could take the sum that came out of one end of the engine and put it back in the other end. Um, he described this as the engine eating its own tail. Um, so he devised a second machine, uh, the analytical engine. Um, he, he didn't build either of them, um, partly because um, it's just really super hard. I think a lot of people ask me, you know, why didn't Babbage build uh, the analytical engine? It's actually really, really, really hard to build a um, giant computer entirely made of cogs. Um, it's not a disgrace not to complete it. Um, Babbage also kept changing the plans. Um, so this is the famous um, Plan 25. Um, it's the most beautiful and the most complete of Babbage's plans. This is from 1840. So this is the machine that Lovelace would have been writing uh, her paper about. Um, so I, I mean, at first, as you know, a comic artist uh, who is not very clever, I looked at this picture and said, ooh, and then I said, I have no idea what I'm looking at here. Um, so in order to draw the machine um, accurately, I had to basically go in and start doing elevations and hunt down as many of Babbage's um, diagrams as I could. Um, it was by no means straightforward um, to do an image of this, um, partly because um, Babbage wasn't very good at doing, at, 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 at showing complete elevations. Um, so this is very much uh, an interpretation of me. But uh, anyway, this is um, possibly the first um, visualization of the entire engine. Um, you may go, ooh, because it took me forever. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there's the punch cards at the bottom. I'll actually show you um, in animation um, how I believe it works um, because it's much clearer. There's a lot going on. Basically, you have storage uh, going down the back here. This is a whole line of gears. Um, for Babbage, this machine was pretty much, ex uh, I mean, exclusively a machine for doing arithmetic. The entire bulk of this thing um, is numerical. So these columns, each of these columns represents a number with 50 decimal places. Um, so each little gear has a number from 1 to 10. It's decimal uh, on it. So you set this to 5, this to 2, and then you have 25. This to 3, you have 325. So it just goes up. And so if you have a column of 50 gears, it's a column of a number of 50 decimal places. Um, 50 is a lot of decimal places. Um, uh, Babbage said uh, himself that the reason he does put in so many is that he thought that should be sufficient for all future purposes of science. Um, 
so that's uh, that's Babbage all over for you. Uh, so here's the um, the three types of punch cards that we'll go through in a bit. Barrels. Um, I should say um, I think the machine was probably actually a bit taller than this. Cats for scale. Um, I think also it's very unlikely it could have been freestanding. I think you would have to have enmeshed the entire thing uh, in an enormous cage to keep it stable. Um, the whole machine is based around um, little numerical gears that turn around and they have locks to hold it in place. And if the lock hits a tooth at any point in this gigantic machine, the whole thing will freeze. Um, so n absolutely nothing can be out of alignment by so much as a couple of millimeters. Um, so stability would be a big, big, big issue uh, with this machine. Although that said, the difference engine works on that same principle, and generally speaking, it uh, it hardly ever crashes uh, ever. So. Um, do, do the replicas of the difference engine people build? Are they also fifty decimal digits? No, they think they're only twenty. So um, yeah, you have a few more, <laughs> a little more space for error in those. Um, Right, so uh, that's the analytical engine. Um, so in the book, uh, without the power of animation, this is the plan I did, uh, it's actually quite a bit more clear um, in animation. Um, I had a great advantage uh, in building these diagrams in that I am a computer animator, so I work on this thing all day long. Um, so this is a simplification. This is sort of a cartoon engine uh, version that's stripped down. Um, partly because it's really uh, difficult to see what's going on uh, when you have the whole thing in. And also, it's so huge. See, I've helpfully labeled the layer whole thing. <laughs> it's so huge, my machine really starts to struggle once you put in all those gears. Um, but it's just decimal places. So this is actually just a slice, and each slice going up is exactly the same. So you don't need all those 50 to understand the, the information flow. So here's your engine. I'm assuming you guys are interested in this because you're yeah, computer people. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> uh, some people start to glaze over, but I thought Google would probably be into it. <laughs> uh, so okay, uh, just so I can explain here, basically the red colors indicate the driver, and the greens are passive. Um, oh, come back, come back. Um, these, so the first thing that activates is the number card. Um, and that will be a card uh, with each 50 decimal number in, in holes, basically, or rather a lack of holes. The way these punch card things work, if there's a hole, so you'll have a whole arrangement of levers, each lined up to all of the holes. Um, you'll have a hole pretty much everywhere except for one point. So as the, pu as the card is pu pushed over the levers, if there's holes, it just goes right through, nothing happens. But if there's no hole, then the card will push the lever at that corresponding position. So that's how the punch cards work. Um, so that will basically select a bunch of levers, 50 of them. I haven't animated 50 because that was just way too much work. Um, and that sends it to an address on the store. The address is on the card as well. Um, Babbage has an addressing system. The machine is an incredibly beautiful and incredibly clever thing and really shockingly like a computer. Um, this is the store. Um, this is short, like the store would have gone on into the distance. Um, Babbage said maybe 100, maybe 1,000, maybe 5,000. Um, everyone wants more storage, obviously. Um, <laughs> you'd run into a problem because the, the entire way that these read, so okay, so it reads one number onto the store, and then reads the second number onto the store. Shook. So that's the two storage positions. Um, now this is the... Um, the operations card. I should say I'm slightly fuzzy as to the order of events. I think the operation card is next, but it might be the address, um, but it doesn't actually matter. Um, the operations cards are amazingly clever. Um, a single hole, they were quite small cards. A single hole um, would then rotate these barrels to a certain position. Um, there's actually three sets of barrels. And each of the barrels has 50 or 80 rows of pegs around. Um, so a single hole in an operations card could activate dozens and dozens of levers, which is what you need to run an operation. Um, the machine could do basically four things. It could add, subtract, multiply, divide. Um, any more complicated mathematical thing you did, you would have to be very clever in the programming end, uh, break it down um, into those four operations 
run it down a string of cards. Um, but it's, um, so all those levers are activated and what they do is they then engage all the levers um, at one of these sections. Basically each of these little sections, this is just a, a cartoon version, all these little sections are beautifully worked out and extremely complicated. But each of these little sections does a specific thing, um, adding or carrying the ones, or he, if you were multiplying a number, it would break it up into multiply by one, multiply by two, multiply by three, into all these sections for speed. So uh, it basically engages that section, so it's all ready to go. Then the variable cards, which is the third kind of card, um, this is the addressing system, basically. Uh, it then says, okay, pick up from address number one, engages the rack. The rack slides off into what you call the ingress axis, which is uh, this one at the front here. So this is, uh, sorry, I'm pointing, which you can't see. Um, so this is the position in the store, so it actively reads out to the passive ingress axis. Then that engages the big central wheel Possibly. I mean, this is all much more complicated, actually. There's a way more bits um, than I'm showing here. Um, and then this becomes active and reads the, num the number off uh, into whatever section it's been indicated. Reads the second number. So now it's got both numbers, and then it does a, th a thing, basically. Um, each of these little bits is very, very specialized for specific um, uh, arithmetical thing. Um, you'll notice the, the barrels are turning around. The barrel would have uh, basically a little program in wedges around. So once you set it up with one operations card, then it runs through a little micro program. That's my scientific sound that, uh, <laughs> that it would make. So once it's done, it hooks back up so that now it's uh, ready to go. The number is processed. So it's taken those two numbers. It could only work on two numbers at a time and spit out a result. So it takes that number, hooks up to the output. Um, the output hooks up to the variable card to take the address that it's supposed to read out to, and then reads out. So now that you have the, the result on the store. Um, and that will animate for you. Now you understand how everything's going on. Uh, it would take, I mean, it, it runs in cycles like a computer. They're just way, way, way slower. Um, an, uh, a multiplication might take a few minutes to run because it's got to go through over and over again. Um, but um, I don't know much about computers. I, I probably know more about the analytical engine and how it works than a computer and how it works. But it's, um, it is remarkably computer-like and it's incredibly detailed. I mean, Babbage left, this is not an abstract concept. Babbage left extremely detailed plans for all these levers. He thought through all the timing. Um, you know, all the weights and all that stuff. Um, and there is, in fact, um, I should give a plug to Plan 28. Uh, if you go to plan28.org, um, there's some crazy folks who are trying to get one built uh, in reality, like they built the difference engine. Um, so yeah, that's the, anal the analytical engine and a bunch of primary documents and my comic. And uh, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we have a few minutes for questions, if anyone has any questions. Hi. So you said there would be one layer of these for every digit of the 50 digits. Mm -hmm. um, do you know how like the carry system works between layers? Yes. <laughs> um, I, it's actually, I put a video on YouTube up and it took me nine minutes to explain the anal analytical engine carry. Um, it's. Uh, yeah, if you go to, uh, I guess I could put it, uh, I could either explain it, bring up that file and explain it. He basically uses like a very, very ingenious um, system. Um, the the carry arms, the spiral ones that go up the back of the difference engine, um, Babbage discarded those because they were too slow. They cost like 10 imaginary seconds off his imaginary machine. Um, so he, he devised, and this was by far his favorite part of the engine was the ones mechanism. So he would be absolutely thrilled that someone was asking that question because uh, um, he goes in his autobiography, he says, this is by far the most important part of the engine is the system for carrying the ones. Um, basically, he had a little peg uh, on the nine on each um, gear. Um, 
so as it came around, if there was a peg, it's really hard to explain. Uh, if there's a peg and a peg below for a carry, it would lift um, two carries um, kind of onto the next gear. It's super hard to explain, but if you come up after, I'll show you the animation, um, and everyone who's into it can see it, which is probably everybody, actually. But it, it, it does take a while to explain, because it's, it's quite fiddly. But yeah, he had it all worked out, for sure. You may have implied an answer to this question, uh, but do, it sounds like you do have YouTube videos with things like this and explaining all of the parts as well. Um, yeah, I've, I've got a couple um, up. Um, the carry one is the most complete. I haven't done I, this one. I'll put up um, shortly with an explanation because oh, I, I just have the animation with no explanation right now. But yeah. Thank you. Yours. So you said that the operations it could do did the four sort of fundamental arithmetic operations. It actually divides. Yes. Uh, wow, because division <laughs> division is is sort of arithmetically a far more complicated operation to do, and like modern CPUs devote an inordinate number of transistors to division alone. So how how does how is division <laughs> implemented here? You're asking me to explain. <laughs> and actually, division is the one I'm fuzziest on. I haven't built it yet. I, basically, it's unwinding it. If, you, if that makes sense, right? Um, so it, to multiply, it's winding mm -hmm. around and around, and it's got accumulators. And, and to divide, it, it unwinds by the divisor. It breaks up the divisor into units, and then unwinds it unit by unit. It's quite complicated, and it's very, um, like everything Babbage did, it's very, very clever, um, <laughs> but quite kind of Rube Goldberg Goldbergian. Uh, it seems like you could just go through and stamp on every part. This part is quite clever. <laughs> Oh, he was so clever. <laughs> so Ada Lovelace famously wrote programs for mm -hmm. this device. Did, were her programs strictly mathematical? Like, like was she calculating logarithms and that sort of thing? Or did she do, did, was there any approach towards the more general uh, computation? Um, Lovelace's paper has, there's a bunch of programs. Um, most most of them are quite short and were sort of Babbage's little tiny workouts. There's a huge fold-out one, the Bernoulli, Bernoulli numbers one, that kind of demonstrates all the loops. This machine can loop, by the way. It can instruct itself to go back around. Um, her, those programs are all strictly mathematical. Um, and Babbage, for sure, only saw the machine as, as for doing specifically arithmetic. Um, so no Minecraft then? No, um, but um, Lovelace um, had actually looked at the machine and said, um, I mean, it was Lovelace who looked at the machine and said, actually, um, with the new developments in logic, um, this is before Boole by about 10 years, but um, she was a student of Augustus de Morgan who was um, trying to find this way of mathematizing logic. Um, so she looked at it and said, you know, with these levers and pegs, um, you could, in theory, turn this into a logic machine, uh, not an arithmetic machine. And her example was, um, was music theory, which is probably way, <laughs> way in advance. Um, but she said if you, could, if you could take the rules of music theory um, and find a way to express them into, a, uh, she didn't use the word program, but into a set of rules for the machine, the machine could, in theory, compose music, uh, scientific music, she said, of any extent. Um, but no, I, I, we don't have any, um, uh, unfortunately, any experiments in that direction from her. Um, and I think it would have, like, you would, to actually do that sort of thing with a machine, you'd have to redesign the whole thing um, because the enormous bulk of it is really, really very, very specialized to, to arithmetical uh, bits. So um, yeah, I, I'm really. Um I'm blown away by the extent to which you got uh, your head in, in, into the workings of this machine. Um, I also expect you got your head into the workings of Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace personally. Can you talk to me a little bit about sort of um, how, how you came to grips with what motivates them as people and um, how and or to what extent you sort of personally identified with them as in the <laughs> in process of doing all the work? Um, I think um, for, for um, hmm. they were both definitely became incredibly absorbed uh, with, uh, with this machine and what it could do. Um, 
in terms of what drove them, it's, um, I don't know, it's hard to say. I mean, I think once, once you see how it could work, you know, especially if you're Charles Babbage with this brain that can see all these possibilities uh, and, and that can see the machine, I mean, I guess what you'd call his spatial reasoning skills must have been remarkable. Um, it drove him nuts that, he, that, that, it, that something he could see so clearly wasn't actually happening. So he became obsessed with solving all the problems, and he kept solving the problems you know, past the point that the problems were so many decades away from existing. You're like, Babbage, stop. Uh, the carry, I mean, the carry mechanism is, a, is classic Babbage in that he had a carry mechanism design that worked, the difference engine one, but it, it was too slow. You know, it had to look ahead. Uh, I mean, it, it couldn't look ahead. It had to kind of feel out one at a time. And he spent a year, he says in his autobiography, he spent an entire year shaving these imaginary seconds off of this machine. Um, so for him, it was definitely solving all these problems and getting the perfect machine. Um, for Lovelace, she's, you know, as, as always, she's a lot murkier and more complicated. And she, in the comics, she can be the Batman-esque, you know, kind of uh, angst-ridden one. Um, uh, for her, uh, she actually wrote in a letter to her mother, it's a bit weird, she, she was very, obviously her father's legacy um, as a genius, but also as a genius who had um, brought basically sex and uh, uh, danger to, uh, into the world. Um, she said to herself that she felt she should redeem her father's legacy by finding a way to unify poetry and mathematics, um, which is an, extra <laughs> an extraordinarily strange thing, but an extraordinarily marvelous thing to say. She said she wanted to create a poetical science, um, which in a way, if you think about it, po programming is a sort of a poetical science. It's a unifying of metaphor um, and logic um, in a way that's, that's very beautiful. So. Um, yeah, for her it was, she felt that, yeah, she had this, this dark legacy that she had to uh, redeem. Um, and in terms of identification, I don't know, I could never have come up with this in, in 50 million years. I'm not a super genius. And I really felt that every second at, at looking at, at this machine and also at Lovelace's paper. Um, you know, to make the leap from this before, again, as I say, logic at the time was still basically Aristotelian you know, in terms of sentences um, and, and, and syllogisms, to look at this machine and say, there's got to be a way to make logic this perfect and this machine-like. Um, and then this machine could, could compose music. I mean, it's just a completely extraordinary feat of imagination to see that in the machine. Um, so yeah, I, 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 um, yeah, I'm just completely blown away by their genius and, and humbled by it. Does that answer the question? Uh, so, in in my reading about this, I stumbled on something about I think they were a pair of Swedish brothers that oh. actually, mm. you know, commercially made several mm. difference engines and had customers for them. Mm -hmm. Did did you stumble on that as well? Yeah, I don't the, remember their names. Oh, uh, the Schutz um, Schutz. I'm not yeah, sure. I th ever, yeah, I think yeah. that's right. I'm not sure if I've ever heard it pronounced. I think it's Schutz. Uh, they were Swedish, um, uh, and actually. Um, I, I, I was delighted to see some um, Swedish comics blog pop up when the book came out saying, as we all know, the difference engine was actually built by the famous Swedes, the Schutz brothers. <laughs> Everyone has their own kind of national history of the computer. Um, yeah, they built the machine, they built an their own machine off of Babbage's um, arithmetic, basically, this method of differences. Uh, but they, they had a completely different mechanical system. Um, it's a, it's a, they, when I saw one at the Science Museum, um, I thought it was a model, because it's a tenth of the size or less than Babbage's engine. Um, and there's, there is, in fact, a beautiful video of it on YouTube. If you look up Schutz Difference Engine, it'll come up, because I think the Smithsonian has one that they run every once in a while. And it's just, it's an absolutely delightful little machine. But as it turned out, it, it, nobody really needed a different engine after all. So um, I don't think it, they made any fortune off of it, unfortunately. I think I heard they built like three or something. Yeah, there's one in, the, I, I guess, the astronomic, astronomical lab in the US bought one. And uh, there was one in England and I, one in Sweden, I guess. And everyone was like, oh, actually, these aren't that useful. So. <laughs> 
it's quite sad, actually. I recall a reference early in the book, it was a passing reference, it must have been a footnote, that mathematics would not only probably be too rigorous for the spirit of a woman, but also her constitution, which seems obviously odd to modern ears. Um, how many women mathematicians were there at the time? Uh, Loveless seems to have been fairly well accepted as one, but was it in fact an anomaly for there to be a woman mathematician? Was she seen as some sort of oddity or? Yeah, I mean, what, people tend to see it as cute, to be honest. It's, it, they, they tend to write, oh, you know, isn't that adorable, a woman trying to do mathematics? Um, the letter about her, uh, about mathematics damaging a woman's con constitution is actually from Augustus de Morgan, um, who wrote to her mother saying, uh, twice apparently, saying, I'm, I'm very, very concerned because um, Lady Lovelace has as much mathematical power as would challenge the constitution of a man. And, you know, somehow, you know, this, he felt that it was overclocked for a woman's body. I mean, this was actually a very common idea. And he said, uh, he, he, gave, he gave me some great comic book dialogue. He said, soon the battle between, soon the struggle between body and mind will begin. <laughs> um, and I mean, it's, it's actually incredibly sad and ironic because the idea was that, um, Math, that mathematics, the excessive use of that part of the brain would specifically damage women's wombs. Um, and Lovelace did in fact die of, of uterine cancer. So um, yeah, it was just, I, and I can't find anyone using that as proof. I'm sure somebody somewhere <laughs> said, I told you. Um, uh, and actually Lovelace's um, mentor was Mary Somerville, um, sorry, I'll leave it up. Um, after whom Somerville College in Oxford is named. She did all these very complicated translations of works from the continent. And Lovelace was very definitely modeling herself on Somerville in doing the translation of the analytical engine uh, paper. Um, but Somerville um, had to study in secret because her parents thought she would hurt herself uh, studying math. And her, I think her first husband didn't agree with her studying math. So she, she wrote her first mathematics book when she was 45 uh, when he died. <laughs> That's when she got her first freedom. So no, it was very, very unusual. I mean, it was, Lovelace is kind of at the end of that era. Um, they started to have uh, women's programs in college in the 1870s, 1880s, and I think that's when it started to turn around. So I wanna thank you for all the amazing work you've done, the, the great comic and the really beautiful book. Um, but. Uh, I've got to wonder, like, where are you heading now? Like, you know, you said that you were sort of ambushed by the comic, and is there still going to be a comic? I mean, I hope. Uh, yeah, no, I, I get this question a lot, and I'm, I'm just kind of, um, uh, I actually, I have not quit the proverbial day job. Um, I still work as an animator, um, which is quite uh, all-consuming work uh, when it's on. Um, I definitely have a bunch more comics I'm dying to do. I've got a ton of. Uh, sketches so when work dies down a bit I'll be I'll be cracking on for sure it, um, my understanding is that there was a couple of critical problems maybe just one that needed the difference engine mm -hmm. uh, back when Babbage was born computer was a job title mm -hmm. they were the people who manually computed tables of logarithms and they were full of errors and this led to things like ship sinking mm -hmm. and it may just be that one difference engine was enough to solve that problem and there weren't any other <laughs> problems. Yeah, I mean, the, the, this was kind of Babbage's thing. The, the difference engine wasn't supposed to solve a specific calculation. It was supposed to print out these big tables because what, what would happen is you'd have these giant books of every iteration of a problem. And then when you were at sea without your difference engine um, or in your accountant's office or whatever, um, you would just go to volume 15 and pull it up and look up that one little iteration. Um, but Babbage himself actually uh, supervised this production of these, you know, beautifully triple checked, error free logarithm tables, after which, yeah, you don't need any more because they're all done. So that was, um, yeah, the, the difference engine was redundant by the time, um, you know, those tables were printed. So. I think for him it was more of an art object, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> he, did, he used to, to throw a lot of stuff around about all the problems it could solve, but he was really more into just building the engine itself, I think. What's happening to your originals from the book? Oh, uh, there are in 
fact, no originals from the book. Uh, it's completely drawn uh, in Photoshop <laughs> on uh, Cintiq. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a virtual comic, computer generated. <laughs> so if the point of the engine was to you know, produce tables of numbers without errors, and he had 50 decimal digits of precision, did he ever work out how many volumes were going to be required <laughs> to print that out? <laughs> I am quite sure he did. <laughs> Babbage was a Babbage loved working stuff like that out. Um, so I can't tell you specifically, but I will tell you if it involves working out an amount of a thing, um, Babbage would have done it at some point. <laughs> Even under fixed point, you're talking about a lot of books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are there any other questions? Okay. Well, let's thank our guests. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.